Republican incumbent Ted Cruz and Democrat Colin Allred face off in a fiery debate in the race for U.S. Senate in Texas. The candidates sparred over abortion, the border, inflation, and January 6th. Jesse Burns, senior editor at The Hill, joins us to discuss this and more. Jesse, clips from the debate are going viral on social media, especially where Allred attacked Cruz over abortion rights in January 6th. But I actually thought both candidates performed pretty well in the debate. What did you make of it? Yeah, well, this is definitely an uphill battle for Colin Allred, right? And so going up against Cruz, you know, six years ago, Cruz won re-election by just over two and a half percentage points. Right now, the race is essentially at that margin. And so Democrats are feeling hopeful that they can pull up a huge upset victory in Texas, but it's a huge uphill battle nonetheless. Now, Colin Allred, as we saw last night, very fiery performance going after Cruz over that 2021 trip to Cancun that he is notorious for uh, being spotted at the airport. Uh, and still is continuing to hang over his head politically, uh, but also attacking him on the issue of abortion, which of course is a, a huge issue uh, for voters across the country. But we understand even in Texas, which is a red state, abortion policies have been largely unpopular that have been advocated by for uh, by uh, Republicans. And so it's a, a narrow lane for victory for all red and Democrats to try to upset Cruz. And they're trying to do it by focusing on issues like abortion, January 6th, and not on the national issues uh, that Vice President Harris is campaigning on. And in fact, all red last night in the debate really trying to keep Harris at arm's length because they know that if Cruz is able to tie him to Harris, it's a much more difficult proposition to try to win in November. And just, you know, it's interesting because Texas was once thought to be trending blue, but Democrats do keep coming up short. You talked about it a little bit. A shift in support among Latino voters towards Republicans, especially in those border communities, is helping the GOP in Texas. Polls in this cycle, again, show Republicans with that small but pretty consistent lead there in the Lone Star State. Do you think Texas is out of reach for Democrats? Well, it's certainly not a state that is likely to go towards uh, to Democrats, although, you know, Cook Political Report and others have moved it closer to Democrats in terms of forecasting uh, leading up to November 5th. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily out of reach for Democrats, uh, but it is a very tough battle. We know historically uh, that Democrats have raised tens of millions of dollars for these type to, uh, types of races in Texas to try to unseat Cruz uh, and, and others. And it's really, they've come up short every time. And so this year with uh, immigration playing so heavily uh, nationally, uh, it's also a huge issue, of course, in Texas and the other border states. And so uh, they are also having to deal with this uh, on a much uh, more personal level. And it's front and center. And that's really benefits Cruz. The battle to replace Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell is heating up with Senators John Cornyn of Texas, Rick Scott from Florida, and John Thune from South Dakota all vying for the spot. Now, depending on what happens in the election, the winner could play a key role in what happens here in Washington next year. More than a trillion dollars in spending bills are caught up in this fight. Tell us about the different dynamics at play. Yeah, well, for each of these candidates, you know, this is one of the major leadership races that we're watching here in Washington. It's expected to be held a week after the election in mid-November. And really, who controls the Senate um, from a leadership perspective for Republicans can play a huge role in terms of the policy that they are able to advocate and the battles that play out every year on Capitol Hill, largely surrounding spending. And so for Republicans right now, there's a lot of jousting for these top positions. And hanging over for this entire race for the Senate leadership is Trump. And the battle over whether he wins in November, uh, he is going to have a lot of sway, not just with House Republicans, but with Senate Republicans. And so for all of these GOP contenders vying for top leadership positions, how they can deal with supporting Trump and cultivating that relationship is going to go very far in terms of helping their own careers in leadership uh, at the high level in Our Washington. A record 300,000 voters cast ballots in Georgia yesterday on the first day of early voting. That's more than double the first day total from 2020. Republicans are leaning into early and mail-in voting, a change from 2020, when many in the party expressed skepticism over those voting methods. Are these numbers good for a good sign for Republicans? Well, I think that Republicans are going to be reticent about these numbers because, you know, we'll have to wait and see to see exactly how many uh, are splitting. Typically, Democrats benefit more from early voting. Uh, and of course, Trump going back to election cycles has cast doubt on early voting and mail-in balloting. And so, you know, that is uh, we've seen a change in that messaging uh, in the weeks leading up to this election. Uh, but it still remains to be seen whether many of those voters are actually breaking for Democrats or if Trump is actually picking up a sizable number of them. 
Uh, of course, we know that Georgia is one of the key battleground states in this election. And if Democrats can ramp up their early vote count, that really helps them going into November 5th. Of course, a lot of Republicans vote same day. Uh, but in Georgia, in particular, a third of the electorate uh, is black. And so uh, having those minority uh, voters get to the polls, uh, that is very key for the Harris campaign and something that she is really focused on uh, these last few weeks and leading up to November 5th. Former First Lady Michelle Obama will head to Georgia to stump for Kamala Harris in the final days of the campaign. Michelle Obama will headline a Get Out the Vote rally October 29th in Atlanta. What do you think Michelle Obama offers as a surrogate in those last days of this campaign? Well, she's hugely popular, of course. She is one of the most popular uh, politicians in the country, certainly one of the most popular Democrats in the country. And we saw her at the DNC earlier this year really going after former President Trump, having really a takedown of him on several issues and uh, have this kind of really um, you know, attack mentality going after him, uh, but in a way that is sure to fire up Democrats and fire up the base. And so really for Vice President Harris, that is who she needs in the final closing moments of this campaign. We've already seen former President Obama hit the campaign trail for Harris in places like Detroit, but now we're seeing his wife, former First Lady Michelle Obama in Atlanta, and that is a key campaign appearance in the final closing moments of this election. A judge in Georgia, uh, Georgia has blocked a rule passed by the state's election board requiring hand counting of ballots cast on Election Day. It's a win for Democrats and liberal voting rights groups who argued the rules could allow Republicans to refuse to certify election results if Donald Trump loses the state. How big of a deal do you think this fight in Georgia really is? Well, there's certainly no ruling out the fact that it could play an important role. Uh, of course, going back to 2020, we know that in every of these battleground states, they're going to be closely scrutinized. The, uh, the, the operation operations on election day, the vote counting. Uh, for Democrats, they don't want extended delays in places like Georgia because they understand that the longer the race is uncalled in many of these states, the more chance uh, they are giving to Trump to cast doubt on the ultimate results if, in fact, Trump loses. And so for Democrats, they did want to push for this uh, rule to be overturned. And so this is a win for Democrats, but they are closely monitoring, uh, and as are Republicans, closely monitoring the rules leading up to election day. RFK Jr. posted on social media hinting at a significant role he plans to play in a possible Trump administration. I'm here outside of the United States Department of Agriculture to tell you about a win-win policy that I'll be pushing in the Trump administration. We're going to rewrite the regulations to give the smaller operators a break. We're going to encourage sustainable regenerative farming that can build soil and replenish aquifers. We're going to ban the worst agricultural chemicals that are already prohibited in other countries. And we're going to remove conflicts of interest from the USDA dietary panels and commission. Now, RFK Jr. seems to be gunning for a role working on agricultural policy and taking on the USDA. What do you make of this? Has Trump made any indication of what type of role RFK Jr. could take in his administration and how much of an impact he could have? Well, Trump has certainly praised RFK Jr. both before and after that key endorsement uh, before he dropped out of the race. Uh, you know, he, RFK Jr. has been touted for a potential role in the Trump administration. He's been floated for HHS secretary. Uh, this video that we just played, uh, him standing outside the Department of Agriculture. Um, so there is going to be some type of role for him. I think one one of the key things to watch is if there is a Trump administration and if he does have a role, is it a role that is uh, that needs to be confirmed by the Senate? RFK Jr. would be have faced huge hurdles trying to uh, to actually successfully get Senate confirmation, uh, both among Democrats, but also I think some Republicans. And so uh, I, I think leading up to a second Trump administration, if there is one, uh, is it a, a cabinet position or is it maybe a role in the White House that doesn't need Senate confirmation? Uh, but clearly uh, RFK is signaling he wants to be involved on issues relating to health, relating to food and nutrition, and the way that the federal government approaches these big topics. All right, Jesse Burns, senior editor at The Hill. Thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate your insight. Thanks, Drew. Elon Musk's aerospace company SpaceX is suing California regulators, alleging they blocked rocket launches because of political bias. They say panel members purposely blocked SpaceX from increasing the number of rockets launched from a U.S. airbase in the state because of Musk's political views. Now SpaceX is seeking an order that would bar the commission from regulating the company's workhorse Falcon 9 launch program. The company has used Vandenberg uh, Space Force base in Santa Barbara to launch its rockets since 2013. 
The commission oversees the land and water usage within California's coastline and said that commercial space launches are not federal government activity. Musk has recently been in the limelight over his support for former President Donald Trump. Rideshare service Lyft is launching a voter transportation initiative. The company has announced it will offer discounted rideshare, bike share, and scooters on Election Day in a bid to increase transportation access for voters. Customers who use a designated Election Day code will get 50% off their ride. That offer will be valid from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. in every time zone. Lyft says they have already helped more than 3 million people vote this year and says they plan to increase rides to the polls by 25 percent. The U.S. Department of Transportation is issuing a $4 million fine against German airline Lufthansa after it says the airline discriminated against more than 100 Jewish passengers in 2022. The department accused the airline of stopping a group of 128 Jewish passengers from boarding their connecting flight in Germany. According to the Transportation Department's investigation, the passengers were traveling from New York to Budapest with a layover in Frankfurt. That's where the department says that the airline prohibited the group from catching their next flight due to an allegation of misbehavior. And although the captain alerted security that some passengers were not complying with instructions, the airline never identified any single passenger that did not comply. The $4 million fine is the largest ever levied against an airline for a civil rights violation. Lufthansa says it has fully cooperated with the department's investigation and has taken steps to address anti-Semitism anti and discrimination. The Federal Trade Commission has announced a rule to make it easier to cancel subscriptions. The FTC is taking steps to help consumers get rid of digital subscriptions and will soon implement a final click-to-cancel rule. The rule will require sellers to make canceling subscriptions as easy as it takes to sign up for them. The average household in the U.S. pays more than $60 per month on four streaming services, according to a recent Deloitte study. Rules like these go into effect 180 days after it is published in the Federal Register. Less than 20 days until Election Day and both campaigns are turning their attention to one swing state in particular, Pennsylvania. Decision Desk HQ shows the state evenly split between the two candidates. Blake Berman breaks down the data for us in today's Political Minute. Will it all come down to the Keystone State? I'm Blake Berman with News Nation. Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump both campaigning in Pennsylvania, making their final case in the critical swing state. It's good to be back in Pennsylvania. <laughs> we win Pennsylvania, we win the whole thing. Yes. Now, polling shows the race is basically tied in Pennsylvania. According to the Hill Decision Desk HQ Election Center, both have a 50% chance of winning. Breaking down the numbers here a bit further, in Pennsylvania, men favor Trump, 56 to 42, up by 14 points. Harris is up with women, 54 to 43, a difference of 11. By the way, a poll from Quinnipiac University shows voters prefer Trump over Harris there to handle the economy, but the same poll says Harris wins when it comes to shared values. I'm Blake Berman, and this is the News Nation Political Minute. And that's today's Daily Debrief. I'm Drew Petromo. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel. And come back here soon for the intersection between politics and policy.